Yeah, so my name's Austin, like I said, and uh, some of you guys might not know who I am. My wife and I are a part of the Rogue River launch team that is happening over in Rogue River. We're starting a church out there, and Maddie and I have had the privilege of living in that community now uh, for a few months. And uh, over our time living there, God has been doing remarkable things. When I say that he's been opening doors and revealing ways that we can love and serve that community, it is really quite remarkable. I'm talking about ministry opportunities with the youth and with the poor, with the underprivileged and the less fortunate. And being a part of a church plant of River Valley is really one reason why I feel so incredibly privileged to be a part of this church, this body of believers. In fact, just two weeks ago, my wife and I were at the dinner table and the question came up. What would you do for the rest of your life? What would your dream job be? No money involved, what would it be? And my wife's answer, which I think is just amazing, she said, my dream job is to be a stay-at-home mom. Oh, and that's sweet. That's what she wanted to do. And she said that her dream job would be to raise our kids to love and serve Jesus and to be productive members of society. And I'm like, by golly, I picked a good wife. He who finds a wife finds what is good. She's a rock star. And then she says, once our kids are all grown up, she'd want to turn around and start loving on uh, young mothers and, and women who are at risk. And I'm like, wow, you're phenomenal. You're way too cool for me. And then she asked me, Austin, what would your dream job be? And honestly, like when, when I was thinking of my dream job, my dream job is honestly to be a part of an organization that is determined to do all that they can to make sure that the love of Jesus and the good news of the gospel is being proclaimed and explained and on display for everyone in the world to see. That is my dream job. And fortunately, I am in my dream job because as a pastor at River Valley, this is what our leadership, this is what our elder board, this is what they're all about Remember when I first got hired at River Valley, Pastor Roger told me that working in ministry isn't a career, it's a calling. And this is what we are called to do here at River Valley. Believe it or not, we know our mission. And that's a good thing to know your mission, know your heading. And our mission is summed up in three words. Three words that are so easy for us to remember that the kindergartners in Calico could remember. Three words that should be imprinted on all of our brains if we are members of River Valley. Three words, connect, grow, go. You can see them on the screen. Connect, grow, go. In fact, crowd participation is always fun. Let's say them together on three. One, two, three. Connect, grow, go. One more time. Connect, grow, go. This is who we are as a church. All four campuses plus every single life group, all of our volunteers, our elder boards, everybody knows who we are and this is what we seek to do. We connect with Jesus. We grow together in relationships and we make disciples. And today, ladies and gentlemen, marks the beginning of a new series that we are starting called CORE. And what this series is about is teaching through what our mission is at River Valley. Connect, grow, go. And so for the next three weeks, we are going to be taking each one of these words and breaking them down in particular. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And before I really jump into what I mainly want to talk about, I just want to preface our entire series with, 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 with this. Um, if you have friends or if you have coworkers or family members who have at all expressed a little bit of interest in God or interest in church or interest in religious things, I really think this would be a great series to bring them to, to show them what, 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 what River Valley Church is all about. So I just want to throw out there, give you permission to invite people. Hopefully you know you have the permission always. Um, but I just really wanted to extend that out, knowing that this would be a good series to bring them to. And so with all of this in mind, let's talk about the first word. Let's talk about connect. Connect. Connection. Now I think all of us know that being connected is very important. In fact, this is one reason why I think a lot of us, when we go into a coffee shop, one of the first things we do is check and see if they have free Wi-Fi, even before we look at the menu. And I think the reason we want that Wi-Fi is so that we can stay connected to the world around us. 
right? This is why social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are so incredibly popular. Because all of these tools make the world feel smaller, and it allows us to connect with more people. At River Valley, we always say that rows are good, but what? Do you guys know how to finish that? Rows are good, but what? Oh, so good. But circles are better. Rows are good, but circles are better. This is good. Church is good, but life groups and connecting relationally is better. In fact, did you know this? This was quite remarkable to me. Did you know that people that are connected to a group or an organization where regular social connections occur, on average, live five more years than people who are disconnected? That's per Harvard Health, by the way. It's a study done by Harvard. Did you know that people that are connected in relationships with others have lower rates of anxiety and depression? Do you know that people who are connected relationally with others are generally wealthier and more successful than people who live in their own isolated bubble? I think the researcher, social worker, Brene Brown, probably puts it best when she says this. This is a really wonderful quote. She says this, A deep sense of love and belonging is an irresistible need of all people. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to feel like we belong. When those needs are met, we don't function as we are meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache, we hurt others, and we get sick. Folks, we are designed by God as creatures made to connect. This is, this is one reason why, well, one reason that I think that God gave us fingers not just to be able to pick things up, but he gave us fingers to be able to interlock our fingers with loved ones, to be connected. I remember the first time, and maybe you remember the first time you held your wife or your husband's hand. I remember when I held Maddie's hand for the first time. It was on Virginia on the sidewalk. And I remember it gave me a warm feeling in my heart. Being connected to her at that moment was a, was a special thing. It warmed my chest and it felt good. What I'm getting at is that we are made for connection. God created us to connect. It's something that we all long for in one way or another. So here we go. With all of this in mind, what I want to do today is show us what connecting biblically looks like. What it looks like. What does the Bible have to say about this idea of connection. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give us five points as to how I believe the Bible defines connection. And at the end of our time today, the hope is that all of us would have the desire and then um, really just the motivation to work towards healthy relationships, healthy connection in our lives. And so that's the goal. So let's get rolling. Number one, what is connection? Connection is this. Number one, committing daily to Jesus. So if you're taking notes, it's that. Committing daily to Jesus. If you have ever flown in an airplane, if you've ever flown commercially in an airplane, you would know that before takeoff, the flight attendant always will get on the intercom and she will always say something along the lines of, in case of emergency, an oxygen mask will pop down from the top and you uh, will then take that mask and fit it around your head before you help anybody else with their mask. I remember the first time I was flying in a plane, that was kind of interesting to me. I saw, you know, moms with their, with their, you know, children there. I'm like, really? Like, they wouldn't help their child first? You know, it's interesting that they require us to put our mask on before we help another person with theirs. And really, it makes perfect sense. Because the airlines understand that if we are not connected to oxygen, we aren't going to be able to help others. Right? It's impossible to perform CPR when you have no breath. <laughs> And the same concept is true for Christians. Jesus says in John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Folks, it is very important that at the foundation of every healthy and productive and mutually satisfying relationship are people who are connected to God. People who are connected to God, right? Again, I just think of my own marriage. I honestly can whittle down most of the times that there is strife and frustration between me and Maddie to seasons where me and Maddie, one of us, is not fully connected to God at that time. And it's quite remarkable. 
But this makes sense, right? Like, like if you take a, a, a cherry tree branch and you cut it off, it's not going to be able to produce fruit. Like if we were to take an apple tree and cut a branch off when it's full of fruit, it might have fruit on it for a few days after. But eventually, when it's not connected to the tree, the fruit's going to die. It's not going to be able to produce anything when it's disconnected. And the same is true for us as Christians, right? A disconnected Christian from Christ will never be able to live the life that God intended for us to live. It's just not how it works. We've got to be connected. That's why Jesus says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Good luck doing anything of eternal significance when we're not tethered and rooted in the truth of a relationship with Jesus. So that's number one. What does connection look like biblically? Number one, it's committing daily to Jesus. That's number one on purpose, by the way. If we miss number one, these other four, they're not even going to matter. So I'll just caveat that with that. Number two, connection is being devoted to relationships. Being devoted to relationships. Now, here is where a lot of my introverts in the room want to back up and they want to pull away. In fact, if you're an introvert, go ahead and raise your hand right now. Yeah, get them up. You're like, I don't want to. I'm scared. No. <laughs> yeah, a lot of introverts all over. Yeah, and for us as introverts, I'm an introvert as well at heart, believe it or not. Um, this is one reason why we never want to join life groups. Maybe this is one reason why we've attended River Valley for four years, maybe a year, maybe five years, and we've never taken the leap to get into a life group because we know that relationships take time. And we know that sometimes in relationships, like you guys all know this, right, it can be awkward. Amen to that? It can be awkward. It can be a little bit weird. There's some times where the dynamic is just interesting. And so instead of connecting, we have this mindset of us for no more, keep our circles small, build walls up, keep our group in and make sure nobody else can penetrate that wall to get into our inner sanctum. And I, again, I just want to say I'm with you. I truthfully, here's my heart. I would rather have a night in with my wife with a bowl of popcorn watching the office than spend with a bunch of people out bowling. Like truthfully, that is what I would rather do. That's how I would rather spend my night. But you see, as a Christian, as a Christian, believe it or not, we are commanded to be devoted to our relationships. We are. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says this. He says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. I love that. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Folks, this idea of devotion, the idea of commitment is really a beautiful concept. It's this idea of serving without the expectation of being served in return. I remember when Maddie and I were doing our marriage counseling, Roger and Brenda stressed the importance that a strong marriage is not a marriage that meets in the middle at 50-50. That's not a strong marriage. A strong marriage is when both people are meeting at the top, giving it 100% and 100%. That's where a strong marriage is. And you see, one reason I love Romans chapter 12, verse 10, is, that, is because the apostle Paul right here is almost giving, this, uh, giving us this idea to make a competition out of it. Show each other how much you can love. Let's show each other how much we can be devoted, how much we can cherish one another. In fact, one commentary I was reading on Romans 12, 10, said this, we should try to outdo each other in our level of devotion and honor for one another. Thinking of this concept blows my mind. Imagine how different our city would be if Christians were genuinely devoted to one another. 365 days a year, 24-7, every day of the week. 100% meeting each other at the top. I'll tell you some of my all-time favorite stories of love and devotion come from life groups where people do life together and are devoted. I'm talking about, and this is a true story, literally people who need cars and other, and true story, this is River Valley. People who need a car and then somebody in the life group is like, I don't need mine, you can have my car. It's not like they had you know, vehicle number two that they could just drive. They're like, oh, I live close to work, I'll ride my bike. Radical generosity, devotion to relationships, beautiful. I'm talking about people cleaning out houses that are absolutely filthy just because they want to show the world that we love one another and we're devoted. 
I'm talking about people who are going through difficult times. And instead of just saying, hey, brother, I'll pray for you, which is awesome. They're like, how can I help you? I know how. I will bring you meals for two weeks because I'm devoted to this relationship. Or, you know, paying rent. You know, the husband or the wife loses, loses a job and they're not able to make ends meet. People at River Valley, I've heard stories of this, covering rent, covering mortgages for months on end until that family's allowed to get on their feet. And all of these stories are birthed out of a place of people being devoted to relationships. Folks, when the Christian community is united and devoted to love and good deeds to everyone, it is evidence to the world that we serve a God whose love and grace is available to anyone. Does that make sense? I want to read that again because I think this is a big idea. And so I want us to really get this. Here, here it is. So, so focus in. When the Christian community is devoted to love and good deeds to everyone, it's evidence to the world that we serve a God whose love and grace is available to anyone. Isn't that awesome? I think that's why Jesus says in John 13, a new commandment I give you is to love one another as I have loved you. So also you must love one another. And by this, by your love, all men will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. When you love one another. See, folks, being devoted to relationships isn't only beneficial from the biological, cognitive, and emotional standpoint. It's also beneficial when it comes to showing the world that we serve a God who is love. When we show love to others, it's evidence that we serve a God who loves us. That's pretty special. Devotion to relationships. Not meeting 50-50. Meeting at the top, 100-100. That's... Number two, connection is being devoted to relationships. Number three, connection is also living authentically. Living authentically. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. Again, I, I keep talking about life groups. It's, it's honestly not because we're doing a life group push right now. It's genuinely because when we're talking about this idea of connection, uh, life groups is where this happens the most. And so that's why I just keep using examples of life groups is because this is where it happens. In fact, if you're not in a life group, you're missing 90% of what River Valley is. That's our blood. This is who we are. And so I, I love using examples of life groups because this is it. But one of my favorite things about life groups is when we break up and we go into guys only prayer time. And, and the reason I love and value this time so much is because it gives me an opportunity to be incredibly raw, vulnerable, and authentic with other guys. It just does. It gives me that opportunity. And I know this is true for women as well. I've, I've heard just wonderful, awesome stories about vulnerability in these groups. But here's what I want to do for this third point. Um, I want to take a few moments, and I want to talk directly to men, okay? Directly to men. Don't get up and walk out. You don't have to go to the bathroom right now. Stay with me. But what I'm going to say next is a very general statement, okay? Very general statement, and so don't get mad at me, but here's my general statement. Women tend to be more willing to open up and talk about their emotions, feelings, and difficulties more so than men. Generally. Generally. Right? Maybe some of you women right out there are like, Austin, I don't even know what emotions are. I'm hard as a rock. Maybe some of you men are like, Austin, I'm an emotional wreck. I cried in I Am Legend when the dog died. Like, yeah, spoiler alert, yeah. But generally, I think this statement is pretty accurate. Uh, men have a tough time sometimes opening up. And I think the reason for this is because I think we as men want to appear like we have everything under control. Right? We want to have like this, this, this aura of excellence. We want to look like we don't need anybody's help. Like, we're not struggling. We don't, we don't want to look weak, right? At least I don't. I don't want people to think of me as a weak person. And, and, and here's, here's what I, what, what I want to say is I, I want to gently beg. If you're that type of man, and, and you know if you are, if you're that type of man, I want to gently beg you to get over awkwardness and to move into authenticity. To get over that awkwardness and to move in to authenticity. You see, there is this horrible lie in our culture that a man's man is somebody who always keeps his emotions in check. 
That a man's man is somebody who always has the right answer. Somebody who has broad shoulders and calluses on their hands. But folks, this couldn't be further from the truth. I think of, I think biblically, I think of King David. King David. King David who killed lions and bears. King David who took on a giant with a sling and a few rocks. And then cut his head off just to show that he was bad to the bone. (laughs) King David who conquered lands, who was a phenomenal General, King David, in our estimation, in our culture, five-star general. That's a man's man. He does jujitsu. Like, it's a man's man. King David. But did you also know that King David wrote poetry? King David was a dancer. He danced. You, you, know, that, you know that King David cried? You know that, that, that King David wrote love letters? That's countercultural. Hmm. What about Jesus? Jesus, probably the greatest, the greatest man who ever lived. Jesus was a carpenter. He had calluses on his hands. He's a builder. He was a compelling speaker. People wanted to listen to what he had to say. And oh, by the way, he talk, took on the greatest and the strongest enemy of all time, sin and death, and came out victorious. Man's man. John Wayne to the max. Jesus was legit. Did you know that the shortest verse in the Bible is two words? Jesus wept, cried, emotional. With all of this in mind, I want to make the case that a man's man, according to the Bible, is not somebody who suppresses their emotions, but is somebody who is in tune with their emotions and is willing to talk about it with a trusted group of people. I think that's what a man's man is. Somebody who's willing to look at people and the eyes, other men in the eyes, and say, man, here's where I'm going wrong. And, and folks, this is so important. Like, let me tell you, the, the level of wonderfulness that I feel when I'm in a small group, and I can look at Zach Garcelle in the eyes, I can look at Josh Rios in the eyes, I can look at Anthony Stevens or Tyler right in the eyes, and they know exactly what I'm going through. And they can love on me the way that they know how because of vulnerability, because of authenticity. And the only way that that is ever experienced it's when you're authentic. It's when you're vulnerable. James 3, 5, or 5, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We're commanded. I want to make the case that being a man's man is somebody who's willing to talk about their emotions. Somebody who's willing to say, man, here's where I'm really struggling. Now, I know that I, during that whole point, I was speaking specifically to men, and it's not because I don't think women struggle with this as well. I, I just think that women do a little bit better job at this. Oh. So that's, that's number three. Let's turn our awkwardness into authenticity. Connection is living authentically. Number four, connection is this. It's advising biblically. Advising biblically. This one is so important. Incredibly important. Connection is advising bi- biblically. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Beautiful passage. Probably the most popular question that I ever get as a pastor is the question, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? What does God want for me? It's this idea of trying to figure out what path to go down. What school should I attend? What job do I take? Do I buy a nicer car now? Do I purchase a home? Do I keep waiting? Do I move to Idaho now? Do I move later? Should I give permission to that guy who wants to marry my daughter? Or should we try to have kids now? What do I do? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all real questions. Like these are wonderful, wonderful questions. And I think it's awesome that a lot of us want to hear from God. But guys, good news. Fortunately, we can hear from God. We can hear from God. We do have direction from God. It's in the word of God. One pastor famously said that if you want to hear God speak, just read the Bible out loud. You want to hear God speak? Read the Bible out loud. I love that. It's so simple. Folks, the Bible, believe it or not, has the answers that you are looking for. It has the answers to life's greatest predicaments And believe it or not, they're not found on the shelves of Barnes and Noble or the Amazon bookstore. They're found in the Word of God. 
Oftentimes when people will ask me for advice or counsel, one of the first questions I have is, have you opened your Bible? Have you seen what God has to say about this? Have you looked at what God has to say about money? Have you discovered what the word of God has to say about sexuality? Have you, have, you, have you seen the principles in the Bible that point to a healthy marriage? Have you uncovered the truth of parenting kids God's way? I think Christians would have so much more clarity and direction in their life if we quit watching Netflix and we read our Bibles. Like seriously. It's like we'll devote three hours to friends at night, but we won't devote five minutes to reading the word of God. It's crazy. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say that some of the greatest Bible counselors that I know, I think of Tawny, who's here. I think of Pastor Doug. I think of Kathy, who's been on staff at River Valley uh, for many, 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 many years. I would even go as far as to say that some of the greatest biblical counselors are people who study the word of God and know what it says. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So biblical connection with others will always have the understanding that advice will always be shared from the perspective of what does God have to say? Let's look at the Bible. That's number four. Number five, connection is encouraging faithfully. Encouraging faithfully. I remember I was in college and my professor was talking about encouragement and he said something that I'll never forget. He said, encouragement is like a peanut butter sandwich. The more you spread it around, the better things stick together. I love that. I love that. Lou Holtz, who is considered to be one of the greatest college football coaches of all time, motivated his players to play hard with one principle, four words. Praise loudly, criticize softly. That was his principle. I'm going to praise them loudly, and I'm going to criticize softly. You see, at the start of every season, Lou Holtz would sit down, all of his coaches, all of his players, all of his trainers, and all of their different meetings, and he would try intentionally to create a culture of encouragement what he wanted. You know, I think if the Apostle Paul was alive today, he'd be a football coach. And I think he'd apply this principle to his team. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 saying this, therefore encourage one another. Build each other up just as you are doing. And I think when Paul was writing this, I think that he was probably thinking of a friend that he had, a friend named Joseph who was given the nickname Barnabas. And he was given the nickname Barnabas because Barnabas means son of encouragement. Can you imagine that? Just being such an awesome, cool, kind person that everybody's like, yeah, your name's not Joseph anymore. It's Barnabas. And in fact, people from here on out to the end of time are always going to remember you as Barnabas, the son of encouragement. I, I think Paul was thinking of him. And, you know, there's something interesting about Barnabas in the Bible. Most of the time, not all times, but a lot of the times we see Barnabas mentioned in Scripture, Barnabas is always in the middle. He's always in the thick of some sour situation, an awkward time. For example, in Acts chapter 4, when the church needed money, it was Barnabas who sold his field and laid his, feet, laid, laid his money at the feet of the apostles. Later on in the book of Acts, we see that there was a time when the apostle Paul had a falling out with a young man. His name was John Mark. And later in Acts, we see that it was Barnabas who, who came around John Mark and he put his arm around him and he kind of encouraged and discipled him. And later on, we see that John Mark actually begins to minister with the apostle Paul uh, later. It's, it's, it's a special thing. And and, you know, I was thinking just, just of my own life, of people that have encouraged me. I think of my parents and my grandparents, my siblings, of my wife, who's my greatest encouragement, people who, um, in high school, who, who, like teachers and coaches, all of these people have encouraged me in one way or another. And I was thinking, you know, this idea of encouragement, you know, the one thing that ties all of these people together in my life, the one common denominator for all of these people is that encouraging me costs them nothing. It was free. It was 100% free. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking that, you know, I think encouragement is the greatest gift that you can ever give, and you don't even have to wrap it. Like, you you, you don't even have to get it ready. That's my least favorite part about giving gifts. I hate wrapping gifts. I think it's the worst. And encouragement, I can just say it. I don't even have to wrap it. It's free. I can just give it to people. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when when I'm encouraging somebody, it's just the sweetest thing to see somebody's face light up. It's amazing. It can totally change the trajectory of somebody's day. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And so, so that's, that's, that's number five. 
Biblical connection looks like being a Barnabas and encouraging each other faithfully. And folks, this is who we are at River Valley Church. If this is your first time visiting us, this is who we are. We strive to be a church that's committed to Jesus, a church that's devoted to relationship, a church that lives authentically, a church that advises biblically, and finally, a church that encourages faithfully. Now, at this point in the message, maybe if this is your first time ever joining us for a service, or maybe you're just wondering this, maybe, maybe during this entire time, you might be wondering to yourself, okay, this is all cool, this is all fine and dandy, I, 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 appreci- I appreciate the, the mission, but, but, but why? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to live authentically? Why, why do you guys even care? Well, well great question, thanks for asking. Here, here's why it matters. Here's why it matters, and here's why we care. You see, this is so important. The reason we commit to Jesus is because Jesus first committed to us. He first committed to us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says that we serve a God who will never leave us or forsake us. The reason we're devoted to relationships is because God is devoted to his relationship with us. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 says that we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus, not because of what Austin Abbott did, but because of what Jesus did for me by dying on the cross and raising to life and claiming victory over death. That's why I'm devoted to relationships with others, because Jesus is devoted to his relationship with me. The reason we live authentically is because Jesus lived his life authentically. In Matthew 27, Jesus had his clothes ripped off of him and then was whipped ruthlessly, hung on a cross, naked before everyone to see, humiliated, vulnerable. Jesus wasn't awkward at this moment. He was showing his authenticity as our Savior. The reason we advise biblically is because we believe in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, that a day is coming where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we believe that's coming soon. And then the reason we encourage faithfully is because God, in his graciousness, has given us a gift. He's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 9, the Holy Spirit is described as somebody who encourages us and comforts us in our mountaintop experiences and in our valley low experiences. Folks, we don't strive to connect because we want to be a cool hangout, a place where people gather, a cool edgy place where, where you know, all uh, neat people meet up. We strive to connect with God and with each other because we believe that connecting with Jesus as Savior is the way to eternal life, and that's what matters to us. That's what matters. So connect, grow, go isn't just a fun little saying that's, that's catchy and that we throw it on our side of our building or something like that. Connect, grow, go is who we are as believers. And if River Valley is your home church and you're a part of this gathering of the saints, the hope is, is that you would be motivated and you would be inspired to live a life of connection with God, which inevitably is going to lead to growth with God and then transform you into being somebody who wants to go into our city and make disciples. Show them the love of God. That's the hope. That's the desire. That's our mission. That's at the core of River Valley. We want to connect with Jesus. We want to grow and we want to go. It's a privilege to be a part of a body of believers who's intentionally living their lives to see the world connected to our Savior. Amen? That's what it's all about, guys. Let's pray.